Welcome. So we're here to talk about mentoring magic, the art and science behind great relationships. Um, I'm Lisa Beth Lentini Walker, and I am the co-founder of MentorCore. And MentorCore is dedicated to connecting compliance and risk professionals for better outcomes, better professional outcomes, better life outcomes. And so we're very dedicated to the concept of mentoring, and we have some defined perspectives on what works and what doesn't work based on some of the, the research and science behind it. So Dan, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan Ayala, and we unfortunately, we skipped over your picture here, but this is Lisa. Uh, and I'm Dan Ayala. I'm, uh, I'm the other co-founder of MentorCore, uh, and uh, I'm an information security professional for the last 25 years, uh, and have been doing mentoring of some kind probably for the last 19 years, uh, and have been mentored for most of my career. I was the recipient of some very quality mentoring, both in my upbringing and early in my career. Uh, and it really instilled in me the value of both getting and giving and and receiving of that kind of uh, that kind of advice as a mechanism of growing. So welcome. We're excited to talk to you today. Great. Um, so when we started talking about what some of the keys to mentoring were, um, there were three things that really stood out to me at least, um, that's there has to be some type of a synergy. The relationships are really at the core of what matters. And there's a unique way that me a mentor and a protege interact that is different from other types of relationships. So let's start first uh, talking a little bit about the synergy that's there. Um, a lot of times people think that mentoring is a one-way street. And I'm here to say it's absolutely not. Um, I think that's a very old school perspective, almost like what they talk about with apprenticeships. Um, and mentoring has grown and developed over the years such that it's very, very much a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and it really is based on helping each other think about things in a different perspective. Yeah, and, and the one thing that's interesting about mentoring, and I think it's er important to, uh, to call out early, is that there's a really big distinction between mentoring and coaching. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, people, people's natural reaction when asked a question is to provide an answer. And, and that's more aligned with something like coaching. Um, but the, the fundamental tenet of, of mentoring is to help people get to their own answers, to get to the decisions and get to the understanding and, uh, of, what, of, the, of the question that they asked, uh, but do it on their own, at their own pace, at their own way. Um, advice can be part of mentoring, but the primary, the primary um, importance in mentoring is to let people help people move along the journey uh, and get to the outcome that they're after, but do it on their own. Yeah, and I think that there's a big difference too between like a manager doing HR coaching versus someone who's an executive coach, for example. Um, executive coaches don't give you the answers ever, but your manager, if they're coaching you on how to get to the right place, absolutely thinks that there's a defined a defined way of doing that. Um, right. But even there, you said the word coaching. Yeah. Which is, I think, does we're starting to see as a as a, as a culture people using those terms uh, in more of that more of that um, explicit way, where coaching is about giving advice and mentoring is about helping to bring people along on the uh, help people along on their journey. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that there's uh, a lot of myth around this one way street. And really, a mentoring relationship should be enriching for all parties, right? So it is very much about a learning environment, and it's learning on both sides. So anytime that you have a mentoring relationship that doesn't involve some form of mutuality, I, I believe that there is less effectiveness to it because the person who is the protege absolutely feels when they're not contributing something 
and then that relationship starts to decline. So there need to be ways that both parties are recognizing what talents and skills and perspectives are being brought to the table and that there, there's a way to honor that. Yeah, without without question, and the bidirectionality of that, I think, is the uh, it's one of the one of the paramounts of of mentoring, but also one of the hardest things to achieve. Uh, it takes a lot of a lot of trust and a lot of comfort to be able, or a lot and a lot of confidence to be able and willing to do that kind of bidirectional sharing, especially when it's somebody that either is really or perceived to be at a different higher level than you are. Um, and this is something I know I, I, I often struggle with is how do you make the approach to somebody to say that you'd like them to, you'd like their guidance. Um, but then also how to share things in a, in that open and honest way uh, to elicit the kind of uh, personalized and contextual response that really gets you value out of the relationship. Yeah. So let's fast forward a little bit to relationships. Now, in a mentoring relationship, um, the power dynamic can be troublesome if there is one. We would suggest that there be a power-free partnership where there's not actually someone who is above another person within an organization because there's a very different dynamic to someone who you believe has control over your future as opposed to someone who you go and solicit information from or solicit perspectives from. So that power dynamic, and I know we've become far more attuned to power dynamics, is really important. So it's important to diffuse that so that you can have an effective mentoring relationship. Absolutely. And, and one of the other pieces about just bringing people back to um, a, bringing people back to the idea that mentor, being a mentee or a protege, the recipient of mentoring is about your, you will get out of it what you put into it and you will be able to, you are responsible for guiding the relationship. One of the things that's really, um, it, it is a partnership, but at the same time, you, the one who is seeking information are the one primarily driving how and where and when you want this to go. Um, mente or mentees, protégés that wait for a mentor to approach them and say, so how are you doing? Or have you thought about this? Um, that, that isn't often how the relationship works and is not how the relationship is most beneficial. Uh, if you think about the relationship that, I, I don't know about you, Lisa Beth, but when you have one-on-ones with somebody that you've reported to, um, I found that the best approach to those is you walk in, with your agenda, it's your meeting. As a one-on-one, -on -one, it is the employee's meeting, not right. necessarily the manager's meeting uh, to have. The same kind of focus could come into this, not because it's a subordinate superior relationship, but it's because the person that is after information, uh, after guidance, is the one that should be driving the direction. The mentor will, the mentor will help shape the discussion but the driving force needs to be the protege. And this comes now down to the focus on independence. It is about the person who is receiving the mentor, the, the mentee, the protege, to be the to be independent and drive this. And realize also you can have more than one person you are seeking mentorship from. And I actually I love the idea of having more than one person that you're seeking mentorship from for a variety of reasons. Number one, because the person who you first go to for mentoring relationship may be for a specific purpose. I've heard this referred to as kind of a wisdom counsel method where you have different people in your life for different reasons, much like you have maybe someone who's your spouse, maybe someone who's uh, the person who you go to for, you know, faith-based questions or for, you know, technical questions in your career. Having multiple people who are helping you from a mentoring perspective or this wisdom counsel, I think is extraordinarily beneficial because there's no one person who's going to be great at absolutely everything. So you pick and choose 
who you go to mentoring for based on what their key skills and attributes are. So I have people in my life who I go to and I know this person always knows the best you know, way to attack this particular legal issue. Or this person is really good at, you know, issues that require mediation. Or this person is an absolute fabulous communicator. And that's who I go to every time when I have a communication issue that I'm just struggling with. Um, I think that is a very appropriate way to look at mentoring. You're not going to have one person who's the be all and end all. Different mentors exist in your life for different reasons and sometimes for different seasons. Oh, absolutely. And you go to people, go to where the sweet spot is, go to people, go to people for what they do well, what they excel at. Um, please don't come to me for project management mentorship. <laughs> Not my forte, but, <laughs> um, but, and it's also, people are also quite self-aware or, or whether they admit it or not, they're often self-aware of the things they do well and things that they don't. And when asked, should you, um, you know, could you be, could you help mentor me in this? Hopefully they will guide you and say, you know, I, yes, I absolutely will. This is an area I think I excel in, or perhaps you're better, be you're better served, um, unless you would like to know all the ways not to do project management, um, then please feel free to come talk to me. Um, so there's one other aspect of the relationship that I think we should touch on um, before we get to a question that was put into the chat. And that's in these relationships, always be focused on independence, right? You don't want to cultivate codependent relationships where you can't survive without the other person or you're relying on them for everything. Um, that's not a healthy dynamic. And that's never what a mentoring relationship, a healthy mentoring relationship looks like. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think some mentoring relationships have struggled with. They become um, a little too codependent or a little too reliant on the relationship instead of trying to foster independence. You know, um, one of the things that I do with my consulting practice is my whole goal is to enable the company to be able to do whatever I'm helping them with on their own and have me just you know, be able to, to, to leave and leave them better off than, than when I found them. And I think from a mentoring perspective, that holds true too. Like you're not there, you're not supposed to be there forever, um, but you can yeah. be, you know, you can, you can have a relationship forever, but it shouldn't be the same intensity the whole time. Yeah. And I've heard it referred to as a, like an advisory consultant, somebody you would bring on, you hire for five hours a month and you call when you need. Um, and you, if you do it right, that person helps you to the point where you no long, may no longer need them. Um, there's a lot of value in defining the end boundaries of your mentorship relationship as well. For sure. So we got a question in the chat, which was, as a mentee that has been assigned a mentor for one year, what advice can you give me? My mentor is a legal professional expert in an area of law, which I'm just beginning to take legal courses in. Well, that's a big one. <laughs> it is. And I think my first piece, and please feel free to continue to, as we're asking this, please either grab in the chat or send back into the, um, into the Q and A uh, as we're talking, if we get off course or if we're not hitting it in the right way. Um, but I think the first thing is I'm interested in the assign of the assignment of a mentor versus the choosing of a mentor. Um, and I it, think it, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Um, mentor when, when assigned a mentor, perhaps is somebody like a trail guide, when you're coming into a program, somebody who can be a guide or a, um, who can be a, a shepherd to help you get through some commonly, um, you know, commonly pitfall things or get you from point A to point B as you're starting a journey, which it sounds like this may be. Um, those are really helpful, uh, but I think they're a little different than some of the, some of the more growth oriented mentorship relationships. One can easily turn into the other. If the, if the, you know, if the chemistry is there and the, and the interaction style and trust are there, then yes, one that is a, an assigned mentor or a trail guide can help get, you can, it can become, um, 
a more a broader mentor. Uh, but I think at the surface, the expectations are a little different. At least I would walk in with a slightly uh, slightly different expectations that it is somebody who will help you um, help you get established in the field, help you understand the work you're about to take on or the journey you're about to take on um, and help you navigate either the pitfalls that they've gone through uh, or the uh, the steps that need to be taken to make it successfully through the first X period of time or over this next year uh, to shepherd you through what could be, um, you know, what could be a curvy road. So one of the things that I, I agree with what Dan said, um, one of the things that I like to do is to almost set up an informational interview and ask questions so that you, the get to know you questions, uh, things like, what are you most proud of in your career? What um, things do you do better than anyone else in this profession? What areas don't you like to practice in? And get to know that mentor first, because the answers that you get to key questions about what they take the most pride in, um, where they've seen the most success, what they love about the profession, what they struggle with in the profession, will give you a really good idea of where that professional expert excels and where they may struggle more. And then I would take wherever they excel and say, how does this align with what I would like to accomplish in the, in the relationship? And if what you want to accomplish in the relationship is, well, what classes should I take to be just like you, then you have a path to get there. Or if the, you know, answer is, I want to know um, what it takes to be successful as a um, whatever professional you are. You can define what your end goal is and what information you would like to get out of that relationship, but start with understanding who that person is and what their key characteristics are, where they are absolutely superb, and then figure out how that can help you. And how they got to the point of doing this kind of mentoring. What was their journey to get there? What's driving them and motivating them to have to be part of this mentorship program? It's a really great thing that they're doing. Um, that'll give you some insight into the history as well. Um, and perhaps even give you a path to take and turn around and give back to the next people coming uh, down this same path. Right. Right. And I always think it's good whenever you're starting a mentoring relationship um, as the one who's receiving the mentoring um, to ask, how, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. Because that leads to more mutuality in the relationship. And there is always something, um, whether it's a new set of eyes because you're new to the profession or maybe you're really social media savvy or something else. Maybe you're coming from a different industry and you have expertise to share that will drive the deepening of the relationship in a way that becomes far more meaningful. Great question. Great um, <laughs> uh, so Actually, as before Dan we go on, Lisa Beth, I'm curious, yeah. I have a question for the group and I want to start, I'm going to use the polling feature and, oh, and, and start out with, I'm just curious of the people that are here. Who, how many of you have served as a mentor for somebody and how many of you have been, a me been mentored by someone? The poll is open. Except I can't, apparently the host and panelists we, can't We don't vote. get to vote, unfortunately. <laughs> but I see others are voting and that's good. Oh, that's that means wonderful. It's working. Give it just another two seconds. And we'll end the poll. All right. So I see 60% uh, have served as a mentor for somebody and 80% have been mentored by someone else. That's the fantastic. I didn't ask that I would love to ask is, is, yeah, is how many good? Of the people that are mentoring <laughs> somebody now are doing it because they were mentored by somebody else to start. Oh, I don't have that typed one. into the poll. So, but uh, you know, it's a, yeah. I think that everybody who's um, had a good mentoring experience would like to give back because, I mean, if you've had a good experience, um, it, it always feels like it's something that you should pay forward. I completely agree. Completely agree. So um, let's talk a little bit about how mentoring is unique. Um, 
if it's different from coaching and it's very different from counseling or therapy. Um, it although feel like it at times, it may feel like it at times. Um, I always say actually working in compliance and ethics, it kind of feels like you should have gotten another degree in, um, in, in therapy because of uh, some of the things that you run into. Um, but it is different, you know, you, from a coaching perspective, part of this, a part of the mentoring relationship is really trying to understand what the protege or mentee wants and not in infusing it with your own wishes because it's not your life, right? Um, you need to be able to understand those boundaries and not supplant your desires for their future or what you would want if you were in their shoes into the situation, which can be a little bit challenging. Um, it, it, it's also not counseling or therapy, right? Like if, if there are real things going on, you know, then they need to be with a trained professional who actually does work to help people who are having challenges that require counseling or therapy. But it doesn't mean you can't use the phrase, and this is one of my favorite when talking to people, and how did that make you feel? Oh, of course. It's, I mean, it, it, it's one that's used a lot in counseling, but it's absolutely one here. And how did that make you feel? And what would you like to do about that? Or how would you recommend, how would you respond to that? Some really good questions to ask that could be think you could you could hear as a count with a counselor, but are definitely not counseling. Absolutely, and I think it's also you know from a mentoring perspective, um, to the extent that there ever is some suggestion made, um, it should be very gentle, right? You're not trying to push somebody to do something, but you can come up with suggestions like, well, here are all the different options that I've seen done in the past. And there may be one that's more appealing than another, and then explore why. And explore how the person that you're working with is going to get there. One of the things that I've always liked about mentoring and that I've seen be most effective in mentoring is a level of accountability. Because when you share your goals or plans with someone else, especially with someone you have a deep and respectful relationship with, you feel a little more pressure, desire to actually fulfill what you've committed to before the next time you meet with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one wants to, it's much, it's much less gratifying and much more difficult to say, eh, I know we talked about this date, but I pushed it off. <laughs> Well, but you know, sometimes that does happen. Uh, yeah. Sometimes there's very good reasons for it. Um, but usually at that point, you've got your reasons and you're saying, okay, well, you know, yes, I had planned on writing, you know, this chapter of a book, but you know, these three things came up. And so I changed my priorities since the last time we talked. And now we're getting back to that other priority we discussed. So, um, Let's move on to the next slide. One of the things that we've been doing um, at MentorCore is for events like this, we try to make sure that we have um, infographics that talk about um, something we, we discussed. And for this particular one, we have the do's and don'ts of mentoring from both the mentor side and the protege side. Um, but when we look at all of these, the basics come down to there needs to be some significant openness, which requires trust. And trust is driven by a, a sense of connectedness, like how do you guys find ways where you can connect? And oftentimes the sense of vulnerability. Um, that drives a lot of a trusting, psychologically safe relationship. And then there also needs to be a willingness to give and receive feedback on both sides mm -hmm. so right. yeah yeah hey no and it's a uh, and and going back to the and there's a little bit here but about the approachability of the um in the last slide you know we talked about gentle guidance on the direction this is where things like where when giving and receiving feedback realize these are people on the on both sides of the discussion um and being gentle yet firm, if that oxymoron can work, um, being, you know, being appropriately, appropriately pointed, but not hurtful will help make sure that the feedback that you give and receive is 
both understood that there's some force behind this. This is a this is a real recommendation. This is a real imperative, um, but do so in a way that doesn't close off the recipient uh, from you know from receiving more feedback. Because I know none of us enjoy being yelled at or being um, you know, being scolded when you came to ask for advice. And there was just a great question in the chat that I think we really need to talk about. Um, someone indicated that this may be an issue that they need to get over, um, but it's ego and age. Um, and the person who was writing this said, you know, I'm generally older in my career and maybe more experienced, but have never been mentored. And it seems really difficult to approach mentorship since most of the people who are perceived as more successful and, and possibly mentors in this career are younger and have been in the career a shorter amount of time. So, you know, he, he, this person is just, you know, wondering how do you get by that? And my answer to that is, um, I don't think there's an age limit on when you can be a mentor and when you can be mentored. Um, especially in the compliance and risk professions, um, they're relatively new. Uh, and um, some people transition in later in their career. Some people have been doing it since it started 20 some years ago. And so I see a lot of folks who seek out people who have had um, very quick success in this space. Sometimes their success is predicated on um, some of their management attributes. Sometimes it's because they were in the right place at the right time. I don't, I've never ever had a problem with someone being younger than me um, or older than me. I think that's just one of the things that is the myth about mentoring is that somehow age correlates with your ability to be a mentor or your ability to be mentored. Absolutely. And I know from my own experience, I think, it, well, at least in the information security world, there's been um, the people have come into the field at a lot of different points. It's a it's a young field. It's very not many people have been in it for 25 years. Um, so we have a lot of people coming in. We're trying to encourage more people to come into it. And so we're getting people at different stages in their careers, which I think is excellent because it brings, a, there's this discussion about what makes the best security leaders. And it's people that have not grown up in security. Um, and so I'm actually really excited when people come in at, you know, later in their career into the field. Um, and the opportunity presents itself then. And if I were this person, what I would probably do is approach the, I'd probably approach somebody that is my age equal and not you know, start with somebody who is my contemporary and say, hey, can you help me, help me understand how you got to this, how you got along this path and help me feel what it's, what it's like for you to be you. Um, and I say this only because there, whether we like it or not, there are generational striations. Um, we don't like to talk about it, but it is a reality. And we've gone through different experiences, I think that are more shaped by our generation, by our age contemporaries, than by our experience. Um, and I think that's a good first place to start. Uh, somebody that's an age contemporary that can help get a feel for where to go next. It's not the only place I would start, but I would start, I would start there and say, help me understand how you got there. Um, and where can I go next? How can I broaden this conversation both um, across the field and across the experience ranges? Yeah, and I would say, um, you know, if the people who you are looking to that you think could be potential mentors um, are, are ones that uh, may be a little bit more challenging for you to wrap your arms around, I would start with an informational interview. And I would um, say, you know, I just want to learn more about your career and what you've done and what you found helped to make you successful, you may get some really key insights about areas where they feel they have relative strengths and areas where they feel like they have relative weaknesses. And you may be able to establish um, a, a relationship that feels more mutual to you, um, where you are actually providing that person with something that they consider to be very valuable, which is your um, experience and expertise 
in whatever area you possess that experience and expertise, and they're providing you with other perspectives that you find valuable. Um, so beyond, uh, great question, so thank you. Um, beyond that, I think it's really important to be friendly and approachable. Um, at the end of the day, you don't, you don't want like an ice queen as your mentor because that's not actually going to accomplish what you need it to. I'm you need Lisa. someone. Ice king or queen. Ice king or queen. Uh, I use ice queen for me. Um, <laughs> ice person. Um, <laughs> but you don't want that person to be um, unapproachable and difficult to connect with because then you won't feel at your best and you won't be able to really uh, let out whatever is bothering you or areas where you're really struggling because you won't want to have that vulnerable relationship to talk about the hard stuff. And it's the hard stuff that really matters. The hard stuff is the stuff where you are making a difference. Um, the other thing that I think it's really important is to have a respectful um, exchange of information. Right. No one wants to feel like they're being judged the whole time. So if you have challenges with judgment, um, make sure that you suspend judgment because some of the people who you're interacting with as mentees um, will close down if they feel like they're being judged. And especially if they feel like um, you don't have respect for them or their perspectives. So always ask more questions, always dig deeper, ask the question behind the question and try to get to root cause of, you know, what they want to achieve and how you're going to interact with them. And then the other thing that I think is really important is to make sure that you have really defined goals and milestones and that you're being not only being held accountable to them, but that you've developed them in the right way so that your mentor or the mentee can can make progress. So over the course of whatever period you're engaged in this mentorship, that um, you actually have tangible outcomes because all too often um, mentoring can become just a, a conversation and you're not actually making any real progress. So those goals need to be well-defined. Sometimes they need to change. I know in terms of the last year, there have been a lot of changes. Um, and sometimes the goals that were set out at the beginning of 2020 were not, are not ones that we're, we're talking about in the same way right now. Um, and that's okay too, but it's important to revise those goals if you need to um, in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And just like, uh, I feel the same way when you start, you always know how you're going to leave a job when you start a job. Um, have the same idea when you start a re mentoring relationship. Have an idea of what the end feels like. You can readjust those as you go. You can, uh, you may find that the, that the, that the discussion, the relationship evolves as, as time goes on, um, either to be, either to end more prematurely or convert or change along the way or end later. Um, but go in. Um, it's also a good way to to help set the expectations with the person you're with the person you're asking for help to say, you know, over the next six months, I'd like to understand this. Um, it helps them also get a sense of the commitment uh, that that is being asked of them, uh, and makes people a lot more open to taking on the relationship if it doesn't have an open ended, um, you know, the the mentoring equivalent of uh, of till death do us part. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, and then again, I think it's really important that the conversations you have are confidential um, and they do need to be focused on fostering independence in the long term. So if you're in a position where you're in a mentoring relationship, this isn't for public display. Um, mentorships, I consider to be almost sacred ground. Um, they are a place where you get to show your, you know, worst and your best at the same time. And so that's where the real growth comes from. Yeah. So I, it's based on a conversation you and I were having just before we got started, Lisa, um, about not about compliance folks and not writing things down. <laughs> um, and in security people knowing, you know, about the, the ability to, um, the, the things that are written or sent either are 
discoverable through, um, you know, through company privacy policies? Or do you recommend using personal communications paths for mentorship relationships, business communication paths for, per, for mentorship relationships? Um, and I guess take, I'd say answer as a compliance professional, but then answer as a mentor, as a participant in the process, if those answers are different. So it really depends on what the type of mentorship is, um, right? That's a, a, a legal response. Like it depends. Um, <laughs> Such a lawyer right? answer. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, but I think it does depend. It depends on what the purpose of the mentoring relationship is. If the purpose of the mentoring relationship is to make sure that you are approaching things things in a politically savvy way, it might be okay to put that into an email and just say, hey, you know, I have a question. I'm trying to work with, you know, X person and I'm finding it really difficult to um, get my point across. What's the best way that they learn, right? That's mm -hmm. perfectly fine to put into writing. But if it's, hey, I'm really struggling with this, you know, legal issue and here's what it is, that might not be something you want to put in because all of a sudden you have, you know, disclosed information. Um, yeah, that wouldn't be appropriate on so many levels. Um, so it depends on what you're looking for. And it also depends um, on what type of mentor you're, you're working with, right? If it's a technical mentor, it might be something that um, they can easily point you in the right direction. Um, just through a quick text or email. But if it's something deeper than that, then you might want to do it face to face. I always prefer face to face or via a call or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that, that provides a lot better interaction whenever possible. Um, but with an increasing focus on, um, on uh, asynchronous communication, on the use of, of chat and text uh, as a primary communication mechanism, as we're all sitting, you know, staring at official Zoom meetings all day. Uh, and then, you know, you have your side channel of the discussions that are happening either within the meeting or the other things going on. Uh, no, I would never multitask. Um, but uh, you, know, you then, you, just, you have to make some conscious decisions about where you're committing that particular message to, whether it's email or chat um, and the context of, wh of what path it's taking. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so that was, I think, the end of our prepared remarks for today. Um, we got some really great questions. The do's and don'ts of mentoring for both the protege and the mentor are going to be available to our members on the MentorCore website. Anything else you wanted to add, Dan? No, I just, I think the one thing I want to add is just about failure. We don't talk oh, enough. Yeah. We don't talk enough about the, it's okay, that failure is okay fail fast, fail often, we learn from failures and there will be failures in mentorship relationships. Absolutely. You will pick, you will pick, you have chosen poorly, says the, uh, the guy with the chalice to Indiana Jones. Um, you know, you will, you will make mentorship decisions that are not, that aren't as fruitful as you want them to be or hope that they would be. Take them, learn from them. Do not let that set you back. Um, and, or maybe it, you change the nature of the relation of that particular relationship to focus on the things that that person can contribute to you, uh, to the discussion, um, and adjust and perhaps find somebody else to supplement in the areas that are not, it's okay. Failure is a good thing. Um, we learn from failure and uh, don't let it stop you from going down this journey. Uh, it takes a while to figure out what you need and want in a relationship. If you think back to, you know, when you made friends or when you've made friends and you've made, um, you know, a business, business partners, other relationships, there has been a process of evaluation and reevaluation, evaluation and reevaluation. The same thing will happen here. Too many people get through the first one, go, oh my gosh, that was horrible. I got nothing out of that. Or I didn't ask the right questions and therefore I didn't get the right answers. Try, get up on the feet and try it again. Yeah. You have nothing to lose. Yeah, and I would say um, in addition to that, um, right, if the first mentor isn't the right one, then, then find another one. Um, and um, a lot of people right now are asking what they can do to help other people. This is one of the things that absolutely anyone can do. And all it takes is your time and care. So it's a great way to give back to your community and to the people um, in your profession. Absolutely agree. It's brought me a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit over the years. 
uh, as I know it has you and it's really uh, it's really great to uh, be able to continue to give that back to both the community the venture core community uh, as well as uh, people that I mentor and that mentor me I like to think I'm giving back to them too Absolutely. So anyone interested in MentorCore, you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and um, we have a summer special and that's expiring on the 1st of September. So we appreciate you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody.